Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Chorus's FY15 results announcement. I'm Mark Ratcliffe, Chorus Chief Executive, and with me is Andy Carroll, our Chief Financial Officer. Uh, we also have several directors present with us today, uh, including our Deputy Chairman, John Hartley. The agenda today is that I'll kick off things with the business performance overview, looking at what's happening with connections, the market, and our fibre rollout programs. Andy will then take us through the numbers, including our view on FY15, FY16 EBITDA and guidance on CapEx. And because regulation is largely about numbers and investment, he's also going to cover that part of today's agenda. I'll round things off with some of the more day-to-day -day matters the company is focusing on in this financial year, and then we'll go to Q&A. As I said at our half-year announcement, Chorus continues to operate in business unusual mode, and this slide makes that very apparent. The regulatory impact of the initial benchmark pricing we had to apply from December has reduced revenues by 5% year-on-year, EBITDA by 7%, and NPAT is down by 39%. These results would have been much lower but for the initiatives we have implemented to restrict spending and reshape the business. And at a network level, we've delivered a strong result. Fixed line and broadband connections are up, and our broad, broad, urban and rural broadband programs which have now brought nearly 600,000 end users within reach of better broadband. Fixed line connections were up from are up 17,000 lines from last year. About 16,000 of these lines were unbuilt connections we had identified through billing changes in December, moving to new core systems from the old Spark systems. Otherwise, it was very much a continuation of past trends. Baseband copper lines transitioned to naked lines or fibre with increases of 36% and 110% respectively. Fibre now accounts for about 5% of our connections and naked lines are at 9%. Unbundled lines continued to decline as did data services on copper. We haven't broken out baseband IP numbers from baseband copper yet, but expect to do so in FY16 as they become more material. Broadband connections passed the 1.2 million mark with, a, with an increase of 44,000 connections in the year. Basic and enhanced UBA connections declined, offset by strong growth in VDSL and mass market fibre. VDSL and naked VDSL added 52,000 connections, while fibre line increases by about 44,000 connections. So for the first time since we launched broadband over copper in the late 1990s, we have experienced no net growth in copper broadband across the past year. One thing to note is that we, just as we see in the copper space every day, there's a significant proportion of people shifting premises or services or service providers, so the number of fibre connections we are billing is below that we actually connected in any given period. One area where we are turning our attention is the number of fibre premises choosing to return to copper. Initial data suggests there are about 200 of these a month, which we believe highlights the need for a regulatory and commercial framework that is more fibre focused. This slide recaps the various connection drivers we identified at the half year result, as well as the tailwind from the 16,000 unbilled lines I mentioned earlier. Our total connections continue to be assisted by net migration and the general uptrend in new dwellings, although new data suggests this may be slowing. Our rural broadband rollout has also contributed with the enhanced footprint being leveraged by multiple service providers to gain broadband connections. We've also seen continued demand from about 20,000 dual copper fibre lines. We expect these to be dropping away now that the last of the retail service providers has the fibre voice service available for end users. And with about a quarter of a million end users now passed by other companies building UFB, an uptake of approximately 35,000 lines there is likely to be an increasing effect on Chorus's connection numbers. Fixed to mobile substitution also remains a reality, albeit hard to quantify. We know, for example, of apartments that are fiber capable, but the end user is now not taking a fixed line service. This next slide brings home just how much change has been in the fixed line market in FY15. Subscription video on demand services had a big effect on the industry, with Sky TV's Neon, Spark's Lightbox, and Netflix New Zealand all making their debut. This has flowed over into the types between Sky and other providers. And there has been a huge amount of cons consolidation, with M2, Two Degrees and MyRepublic all entering the fixed line market for the first time. 
Trust Power has also introduced a new dynamic, promoting power and broadband in a bundle with introductory plans as low as $49. If you compared this view with things a year ago, you'd have to say that structural separation has well and truly delivered positive changes in terms of choices for consumers. Also positive trends in the fibre market. 100 megabits per second fibre is now emerging as the default entry level product. And at 30th of June, we had about 30% of residential end users on 100 megabits compared to 22% a year ago. To give you a better sense of the shift that's taken place in July, we had 75% of net ads and changes taking the 100 megabit plan. This helps ARPU with our lowest 100 megabit plan now at $41 compared to the 30 megabit UFB plan, which has recently increased to $38.50. Of our 88,000 fibre connections, 68,000 are within areas where we, where we have deployed UFB in partnership with the Crown, but we continue to see connection growth outside our own UFB areas, typically in subdivisions, and demand for premium business fibre connections again grew through FY15. Our UFB rollout remains on track, with 44% of premises now passed and 1,000 more premises completed than required this year. We're in a space now where we could go faster, but our cash, cash constraints means it doesn't make it possible for us to do so. The 368,000 premises we complete bill for equates to about 495,000 end users who are now within reach of a UFB service. As we've noted before, because we are completing priority areas at the front of the rollout, particularly in Wellington and Auckland, with their high density apartment blocks, the end user count increases at a faster rate than premises passed. The chart on the left gives you a better sense of that relationship based on our current rollout plan. We're now at a point at the rollout where we'll be able to start ticking off the smaller areas that have been completed. And as you can see, five are now finished and we expect to complete another five during this financial year. Average uptake across our areas is about 14%, but remains highly variable from area to area. Of the five completed areas, Blenheim has the highest uptake at about 19% of capable addresses. Recently begun trialling an advertising campaign in Taupo to see if we can help lift uptake, but ultimately it's the service providers who have the biggest influence on demand. We're very pleased with how the Rural Broadband uh, Initiative rollout has progressed. We worked very hard to make our investment in the Crowns go further, and I'm pleased to say that we're tracking to the lower end of the expected programme cost. More than 1,000 schools have fibre available, and 93,000 lines have been brought within reach of better broadband. And as, as a consequence of wholesaling that network across the multiple service providers, we're seeing really good uptake, about 85% across the upgraded and, exp and expanded network. Average sync speeds have increased significantly as a result of the upgrade from 6 megabits to over 9. Averages will of course reflect the distance people are from a cabinet, which tend to be a long way in rural areas. The top 10 cabinets, presu presumably where most people are closer, have an average sync speed of 24 megabits. Just 10,500 fixed lane lines remain to be covered this year. That's about 170 cabinets and we're 75% of the way through the rollout to Vodafone's wireless towers. I'll now hand over to Andrew. Thanks, Mike, and uh, good morning, everyone. This slide is an overview of our earnings result for FY15. As Mike mentioned, the significant reduction in, in earnings reflects the change in regulated UBA pricing on the 1st of December and overshadows the massive amount of work undertaken throughout this year to deliver initiatives to partially offset the economic impact of this reduction in regulated revenues. If we back out the changes in regulated pricing, EBITDA grew by around 5%, reflecting a comprehensive programme of managing for cash throughout the year. Net earnings were also impacted by increased interest costs in the period. 19 million of ineffectiveness, a non-cash item, was responsible for two-thirds of the increased interest cost. The balance reflects a full year of increased interest rates after Moody's uh, rating downgrade and after we reset interest rate swaps to realise 30 million of cash as part of our Managing for Cash initiatives. Unadjusted operating revenues were down 5% compared to the prior year, dominated by that change in regulated copper pricing. 
fibre revenues continue to grow with increasing migration from copper and we also, also, also saw some modest ARPU uplift toward the end of the year as Mark mentioned. On the cost front, we think we've done a really good job in managing costs in FY15 with costs reducing by 1.2% compared to the prior year. You can see those efforts particularly in the labour, network maintenance, other network cost and other cost lines. Our efforts there more than offset un unavoidable additional costs related to increased levels of activity and staffing levels, growth in IT spend reflecting the costs of the new standalone chorus IT infrastructure and some duplication of costs as we progressively exit Spark systems, as well as increased regulatory levies. Network maintenance and other costs reduced with lower levels of RSP network faults, reduced proactive maintenance and reduced non-essential spend and other costs I've touched on reflecting uh, the impact of managing for cash initiatives. Uh, in terms of a stock take on, on those reshaping the business initiatives, in February last year we spent a lot of time talking about how we expected to make changes to manage with the, the regulated price change on the 1st of December. We have intensively managed this business for cash in the last 12 months, implementing over 100 individual revenue cost capital expenditure and capital management initiatives. That isn't to say that we were doing things inefficiently before. It's just that when you are performance managing for cash, rather than longer term value, you make a different set of choices. In terms of the operational initiatives for FY15, we factored their successful implementation into the earnings guidance we provided 12 months ago, and we have exceeded the expectations. On the revenue and cost front, we expected those initiatives would realise between 15 and 25 million of benefits, and we have achieved over 30. On the revenue front, we have repriced the range of commercial services, which are either yielding additional revenues or resulting in less capital expenditure. Costs declined in nominal terms, you know, the first time since the merger, in contrast to prior years, and we are ahead of where we expected to be. This reflects more successful execution than we anticipated and earlier realisation of certain initiatives. On the CapEx front, trends in copper and common CapEx is clear evidence that our initiatives are working with avoided or deferred capital expenditure ahead of budget. Overall, our cash management program rem remains on track, but we signalled last year that many of these initiatives would have longer term consequences we have deferred network and IT spend that is resulting in additional operating costs. In FY16, further initiative OPEX benefits are expected to be limited. We've overachieved this year, and some of the gen generic benefits we targeted are showing up as CAPEX rather than OPEX savings. We've also lost some growth opportunities because of our cost recovery focus on discretionary investment. And by the time the Commission finishes its process, our owners won't have received a dividend for over two years. Unfortunately, needs must, and this programme of initiatives will continue until final FPP pricing is concluded, and then the quality of that outcome will determine the extent to which initiatives can be relaxed or halted. In terms of earnings outlook for FY16, we're not going to get into the game of forecasting final FPP outcomes, so we're not issuing traditional guidance for the full financial year. Further, we continue to believe that FPP pricing shouldn't be lower than demerger levels, so draft FPP pricing isn't an appropriate basis for preparing guidance. Instead, we're providing an earnings outlook for the period that IPP pricing prevails, with an expectation of a modest decline in EBITDA relative to adjusted FY15 EBITDA of $546 million. Why a decline in adjusted EBITDA? We've thrown the kitchen sink at FY15 and delivered EBITDA growth on an adjusted basis, but we can't hold costs flat any longer. There's an underlying change in operating activity that drives cost into our business. 
Both labour and provisioning cost lines will grow relative to last year as VDSL, baseband IP and fibre connections grow. In addition, we're seeing the second order impacts of our initiatives beginning to hit. The first order initiatives will continue, but after overachieving an FY15, we're not expecting much more upside on the cost or revenue initiative front in FY16. So real changes in activity and these second order effects are driving cost inflation. Our BAU initiatives are broadly offsetting cost inflation in other areas. And on the revenue front, while we have a number of revenue initiatives in play, there is also the offsetting dynamic of RSPs migrating from legacy services to cheaper modern inputs. On to capital expenditure. Uh, a total of 597 million for the year, below guidance that we issued in February. This reflects ongoing restrictions on discretionary capex, a strong focus on deferring whatever we can, and slightly fewer fibre connections and backbone build than was contained in our February guidance. I'll cover off fibre capex shortly, so briefly to copper capex in FY15. It was consistent with that in FY14, but there were many moving parts. Proactive maintenance reduced, consistent with our initiatives, as did copper connection spend where we had to implement a new pricing structure that ended up suppressing demand. Going the other way is about five million of spend needed to provide additional capacity for unexpected traffic growth. There is some additional product spend to support boost VDSL, but we ended up spending less than anticipated at the start of the year as we weren't able to introduce our proposed guaranteed throughput product. Common CapEx saw a substantial drop as we completed large IT projects in the previous year and we've been forced to defer IT spend to preserve capital. In terms of UFB communal CapEx, build work is now transitioning from mostly priority areas which were cost, costly CBDs with higher reinstatement, traffic management and other costs, into more suburban streets where aerial access and cheaper deployment generally becomes possible. Average cost per premise passed for the year was slightly above 2100, just below our guidance range for the year, and ahead of the programme view we set out in FY13. And this year we entered into new fixed price contracts with Vision Stream and Downer, providing greater cost certainty and some cost benefits. Our CPPP target for FY16 is in the range of $1,700 to $1,770 per premises passed. Connection CapEx continues to grow significantly as volumes grow, albeit that it was less than we anticipated in February, largely because we didn't end up undertaking the expected level of backbone build. Single dwelling unit connections, which also includes the individual connection to apartments and MDUs and homes along rights of way, cost 61 million, and costs were in the lower half of the guidance range that we revised downward in February. Backbone has tripled relative to FY14 as volume grows. And in this next slide, we provide an, an initial assessment of our program view of the likely quantum of backbone build to be undertaken in our areas and a brief update on our assessment of non-standard installation costs. Firstly, some caveats on the backbone analysis. Initially, it's preliminary. Our physical inventory tells us there's about 135,000 existing MDUs and 125,000 rights of way. They cover a huge range of premises types with many rights of way effectively being infill housing. Of the address points in those categories, only a proportion will need backbone infrastructure to be built. Many can be provi provisioned using similar build tactics to a single dwelling unit, albeit consent will be required. We can't be exact on the proportion that will require backbone build because that is subject to build decisions in the field and evolving build tactics. And of that backbone build, there will be a proportion that is standard and some that will be non-standard. I can't tell you exactly what that mix is either because it varies connection by connection. But there are some trends. While there are non-standard SDU and MDU connections, it looks as if the greatest non-standard element is in rights of way. 
With growing connection volumes, we have had a reasonable amount of interest in the status of our non-standard fund. In our assessment, with growing fibre uptake, plus increasing deployment in rights-of-way and multi-dwelling units, Chorus's non-standard installation fund is likely to expire at some point in calendar year 2016. We and CFH are currently discussing opportunities to potentially extend the fund's life as well as its optimal future scope. Because we are 44% of the way through, our, through building the UFB network, the boundaries between our UFB and our existing fibre are blurring, so we have revisited our growth fibre capex bucket for FY16. So this slide now covers around 30 million of premium business fibre connection capex that was previously included in the growth fibre capex category. In terms of our new combined fibre connection capex category, we are basing our guidance on an assumption of 80,000 mass market fibre connections, around 9,000 individual backbone builds and rights of way in MDUs, and approximately 3,500 premium business fibre connections. Cost-wise, we have a full year of fixed price NGA codes and new MDU and rights of way coded rates, resulting in a reduced resulting in reduced cost ranges for the relevant build types, assuming similar build mix to last year. Average cost outcomes are highly dependent on mix type though, so MDU and rights of way averages could vary materially from this assumption. In terms of guidance for this, uh, for this financial year, this table summarises our expectations. I've already spoken to the fibre drivers Common capex remains broadly around FY15 levels with a reduced level of IT separation spend. Copper capex potentially increases in FY16, reflecting additional investment in network capacity. This guidance summary page uh, touches on the guidance I've mentioned, uh, other than the programme views, which remain unchanged. On the debt front, uh, total net debt has increased slightly over the course of the year, largely reflecting the growth in CFH debt securities in the calculations. So the increase in our net debt to EBITDA ratio from 2.7 to 3.1 times reflects the reduced EBITDA from the last 12 months rather than a change in the numerator. FY15 EBITDA still includes five months of pre-benchmark UBA pricing so if we used benchmark UBA pricing for the full year, the ratio would be closer to 3.4 times. The relevant covenant threshold is 3.75 times. Um, on the capital management front, once we have that final FPP decision, we will have to get our skates on from a refinancing perspective with a 450 million tranche to be refinanced before 31 July 2016 we cannot cope with any more delays. From a capital management perspective, our agreement with our banks in July means that any update on dividends remains tied to the conclusion of the Commission's uh, process. And unfortunately, the Commission's process was delayed yet again, with the final determination now pushed out to December. Uh, in terms of the Commission's process, um, we recently received another draft FPP price from the Commission and frankly it was very disappointing. I appreciate that it is a challenging job but the Commission is in a unique situation when it comes to modelling its hypothetical new entrant. It has up to date information on the cost of building a nationwide network today because we are doing it. Local fibre companies are doing it. These are exactly the same costs that a hypothetical new operator would face. But rather than using this real-world data, the Commission has chosen to do something else. We believe the Commission's job is to model a hypothetical new entrant in the real world, not a hypothetical new entrant in an imaginary one. On the next couple of days, of, oh, sorry, on the next couple of pages, I've summarised some of the key assumptions and outputs from the Commission's analysis. Any one of them in isolation is unreasonable in my view. We're talking between 30 and 50 per cent below the best that can be achieved in real New Zealand conditions, but in aggregate the regulatory error is massive. 
In terms of a few examples of dramatically unreasonable assumptions, firstly, trenching costs. Chorus has real world costs of building a nationwide network in New Zealand today. These costs in New Zealand specific circumstances, or they factor in New Zealand specific circumstances like council requirements, soil conditions, and RMA constraints. These are the same costs any hypothetical operator building a national network would face. But the Commission has chosen to use hypothetical data based on a narrow data set, which we estimate to be half the cost of what is achievable in reality. Why? Operating expenditure. The Commission has taken Chorus's copper OPEX cost and applied a 40% efficiency adjustment on the basis that fibre OPEX would be much lower. The Commission's modelling expert advised that in Denmark, an adjustment of 17 to 30 per cent was more appropriate. To make things worse, the Commission has applied the adjustment to non-network costs too, like annual development and Commission levies. Cost of capital. Among other things, the approach to uh, WAC estimation highlights that the price is highly dependent on timing. Had the Commission made its decision in December 2014, as it, as it originally said it would, the price would be $1.30 higher. Had the Commission made its decision before the UFB deal was signed and investment committed, it would have allowed an uplift. It's not good or predictable regulation where windfall gains or losses simply accrue because of the timing of the Commission's process. We still fundamentally disagree with key elements of the Commission's approach, including the relativity to other regulated New Zealand industries. Transaction charges. The Commission is at pains to point out that benchmarking is inaccurate, but then uses benchmarking to set transa transaction charges in a TS Lyric context. I don't follow this. Again, we have real-world competitively tendered costs that reflect the cost that any hypothetical operator would face. At the Commission's proposed rates, our service company partners would make large losses, the quality of the service would fall, technicians may need to be paid less, and job losses would be forthcoming. Again, it's not commercially achievable or sustainable. Finally, the outcomes from the analysis still don't pass any reasonable sanity check, whether that be on a network valuation basis or comparing prices to competitively tendered fibre prices. I want to spend a bit more time on backdating. It is perhaps the starkest example of Commission unpredictability. In 2006, the Commission argued unequivocally in the Court of Appeal that backdating was was for the long-term benefit of end users and should occur whether the initial benchmark price was above or below the efficient price. Now, via a split decision, the Commission is proposing the complete opposite. This isn't a situation of the referee moving the goalposts by just a few metres. The goalposts have actually been moved to the other end of the field. Stepping back from the specific, specifics, investors are telling us that they are very concerned about what the latest draft decision appears to signal. To them, they're saying to me this draft says, firstly, the Commission will apply completely unachievable and uncommercial efficiency adjustments to any real world expenditure. On average, this draft says that the Commission will only allow Chorus to earn a return on 50 to 60 cents of every dollar we invest or spend even if our spend reflects efficient arm's length rates we've obtained from repeated tendering processes. When that message is translated into our 2015 operating and capital expenditure of around a billion dollars, the Commission's approach is effectively signalling that we wasted $450 million last year. If that's true, Mark and I should be looking for, for new jobs this afternoon. Secondly, after assuming away almost half of our total expenditure, on the balance of our spend, the Commission will only allow a cost of capital return that's at least 25% below what the market expects. Finally, the Commission can change the rules at any point and in a completely unpredictable way. You simply can't rely on any previous Commission views to guide your investment decision making, even those the Commission has presented to the Court of Appeal. The Commission's approach has prompted a significant part of our ownership base to either sell down 
and or tell us not to invest a single dollar more until regulation and its implementation is reasonable and predictable. Ultimately, this feedback will impact investment in Chorus, by Chorus, and investment in other regulated utilities in New Zealand. I'll now hand back to Mark. Thank you, Andy. Um, while the regulatory pro progress and process has dragged on for more than three years now, Chorus has made a tremendous amount of progress in bringing better broadband to New Zealand. Since demerger, we have invested close to $2 billion in fibre capability that has brought better broadband with reach of almost 600,000 end users, including 2,000 schools. We completed our UFB network in five towns in FY15 and expect to complete work in Waiuku, Rotorua, Masterton, Greymouth and Queenstown this year. Sometimes it's very easy to overlook just what's being achieved here. When you tell international visitors that, the, that we're building fibre network in places with less than 5,000 premises, they are truly surprised. In the United States, Google talks about fibre cities, not fibre towns. And fibre is proving a game changer. We've talked more before about New Zealand becoming a top 10 fibre country. Well, the recent OECD data shows that New Zealand has jumped to the first place in the OECD for fibre growth. We are on the way. But with growth comes growing pains. For us, that means we've been taking a long, hard look at how we can improve provisioning processes to meet the growth in demand for fibre. From the moment an end user makes the decision to order fibre connections, there are multiple points of interaction between a multitude of parties. Retail service providers communicate with Chorus, Chorus communicates with service companies, and service companies interact with the end user. And it goes back and forth across the chain depending on whether different requirements there might be for a single premise. That might include consent, specific network design needs, and negotiating visit times. And that all adds up to thousands of permutations across the process, so it isn't really a surprise that though all we have now are 75,000 mass market fibre connections, not every end user is getting the best possible experience they deserve. It's important to remember that what we're doing is on a scale never seen before in New Zealand telecommunications. The ease with, with which copper provisioning happens on a daily basis has probably lulled everyone into the industry into a sense of that this is, too, this is simple. But fibre is actually more like building a gas work network into each and every home. It's invasive and requires a fair amount of work on premise. In preparing to scale up for about 80,000 connections this year, we've identified that it's time for things to change to another gear. In July, we completed 6,300 connections, but pro processing that volume of connections is proving a challenge because of the multiple touch points and interdependencies between end users, service providers, Chorus and the service company people doing the actual work. When it orders first come into Chorus, and there were about 10,000 in July, we need to cross-check the details, the availability of fibre, and then separate, separate out those that require consent. Incorrect correct information at any stage does complicate the process. Then the service provider can schedule the installation process, which has to date been a three-step agree, build, and then connect process with the end user. The end user can take the first available time slot for a visit, or as most people do, schedule in a visit at a time convenient to them. And this is where we experience a lot of issues. About 30% of visits are, re are resulting in a reschedule on the day. That might be because of incorrect communication between the service provider and end user. The end user may have had things change or may have forgotten, or the technician may have not been able to make that time. We're also seeing around 10% of end users cancelling their installation once uh, at some stage during the process, with consent issues being a significant driver of this. Every inefficiency in the process I've just outlined has a compounding effect on Chorus's ability to meet demands for installs and do it well. So things do need to change. We've gone from a point where a cottage industry type approach was adequate to one where industry alignment is needed. Chorus commissioned a comprehensive external review of the end-to-end -end installation experience for end users and we've shared our findings with our largest customers at workshops. We've also agreed what we want that experience to ideally be like. The next step has begun with Chorus itself and we've recently reorganised the business with about 100 roles transitioning into a dedicated fibre team within our customer services group. 
One of the first actions of this group will be to take on the role of booking end user visits and managing the expectations of the end user up front. We expect that to bring immediate results with the amount of reschedules. Also looking at initiatives like increasing weekend provisioning to address the issue of end user availability during weekday working hours. Service providers will also play their part and we are looking to assist them with things like staff training on fibre provisioning and enhanced forecasting so that we can better resource for demand. It takes us, for example, three months to train a chorus provisioning person and six months before that fibre installer really reaches an optimal performance. A shift this year from around 50,000 connection numbers per annum to 80 includes a 60% increase in the number of dedicated technicians or 150 new jobs in just this year alone. This programme of work is now our number one priority. In terms of outlook, Andy has already talked through the financial aspects of what we're expecting in FY16. At a broader level, there are four areas of focus for Chorus in FY16. First, as I've just outlined, a key area is improving the end user experience for fibre connections. Second, there is a lot of work being done at a product and service level to leverage Chorus's open access network more fully. We've committed to extending the reach of baseband IP and we expect to see more service providers taking up that option. We've also introduced a new business wrap on our $100 plus business fibre service, which includes six hour fault response times and assisting service providers in co coordinating complex provisioning. We have revised our pricing on our regional backhaul fibre to assist service providers with increased back bandwidth demand, and the VDSL band plan changes we mentioned at the half year are being worked through with the industry and should be introduced in FY16. These will make a real difference to end users, especially in rural areas. Our testing indicates a 50% increase in average downstream speeds from about 30 megabits to 50 megabits per second. The third area is, of course, the final pricing review. I know a lot of you have regulatory fa fatigue and are, and are hopeful, just as we are, that the Commission will conclude its final pricing review by the latest December timeline. I hate to think how many trees have been sacrificed to the name of submissions and the detailed cost information we've been required to provide. And frankly, the process delivers poor outcomes for the network and, infra and for end users. We have been managing for cash for two years, and the consequences of reduced investment and network operating practices are beginning to show up. The Shareholders Association noted some months ago that the drawn-out final pricing process does not help the credibility of New Zealand's capital markets. I think it's gone beyond that. Chorus has seen the number of retail investors on its register reduced by about 20% since December 2013. They've given up waiting for a return, and the tenor of recent submissions from large fund managers is that they have lost faith in the current framework. Chorus's future levels of network investment are therefore linked, not just to the Commission's decision, but also the impending government review of the regulatory framework. To invest in further UFB and RBI rollouts, we need to know what the rules will be after 2020. We need a fit-for-purpose framework, a regulatory environment that enables shareholders to earn a fair rate of return on their investment, means Chorus will be able to continue to bring better broadband to New Zealand, which as a network operator is what it's all about. Thank you for that, and we'll open the floor up to any questions from analysis and investors. Uh, if there are any media questions, I'm happy to take those at the end. So we'll go to the phones, please. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press zero then one on your telephone keypad. So your first question does come from Barry Dicker from First NZ Capital. Please go ahead, Barry. <laughs> well, it's not Harry this time. <laughs> so um, not Barry. Morning, guys. Um, so, first question: uh, just on the um, the connections capex, what needs to happen in terms of um, things that you uncertainties that you need to get through um, before you can provide some quantum on on the connections capex uh, in terms of guidance for a, for a dollar range, perhaps like the communal. Sorry, Ari, in what sense? I think we've provided you with a program view already, um, which is your 900 to 1100 real, um, and we've talked as to how some of that spend is upfront when you do some of the backbone build. Are you asking you know, what is 
what is the gross program view inclusive of potential non-standard costs? Correct. Um, I, th I think that's that, that's some way away. Um, we've given a, given you a view of the quantity of um, expected backbone build, um, and there is an element of that that is non-standard in nature. Um, and as I mentioned, the scope of that build is a function of evolving build tactics. So I think as you know, as we have more experience with those things. We can probably you know, give you a better sense then of the likely cost of that of that um, additional piece, but I, I'm not going to sure, okay. I'm not going to commit to a timetable, Ari. Okay, um, and, and just on um, the opportunities that are on the table with CFH, can you give any colour on, on what sort of opportunities are being discussed? No, um, they're wide ranging as you might expect, though, uh, and I think we've we've. Um, shown in the past, um, you know, with CFH we can do um, a number of things in terms of moving things around within the existing contract that helps us um, do a little bit more on the non-standard front. Um, you know, we did that last year. I think you know, there's potential for the regulatory framework to be of assistance. Um, um, so so you know, there's, we're, we're looking at a, a range of things, Ari. Sure. Um, just in terms of the 80,000 um, connections um, included within the guidance for this year and understand that um, obviously it's in ramp up and, and it's difficult to forecast, but, but if there were 10,000 orders in July um, and, and you actually did 6,300 in July as well, um, I mean, are you suggesting that the lag is going to grow through FY16 in terms of timeframes to, to connect or are you just, you know, guiding to, to a, a very conservative number in terms of how much connections you'll do. Um, Ari, Mark here. Morning. Uh, we, I guess we're guiding to the best available information. Yes, there were a lot of orders in July, but we had a couple of months where there were low orders before. You also need to factor in, to in the summer period where traditionally orders and connections are much lower as well. So, you know, we're, it's a reasonably um, there is some science involved in getting to the number, but there's also a whole bunch of assumptions in there. But 80,000 is our best view of it at the moment. Sure. Th thank you. The next question we have is from Blair Galpin from Forsyth Bar. Please go ahead, Blair. Morning, guys. How are you? Good morning. Um, three questions. Uh, firstly, in terms of dividend, I, I know obviously we can't, uh, we can't give any idea what it will be, but can you just explain what the process would be post-December to effectively coming out or determining what you could provide as a dividend? Um, secondly, in your FY16 CapEx, is there any um, allowance for extending the USB program or not? And finally, just a, a bit more around the non-standard um, um, allowance you've got for contracts. Are service providers getting involved in those discussions? Because to me it's a a partially service provider issue as well. But just those three, three thank you. Yes, all right. Um, thanks, Blair. I'll have a, why don't I have a go at all of them and then Mark can add, um, yep. add to it. So in, ter in terms of the dividend, I think, I mean, you understand that um, yeah, we are able to pay a dividend until the process is completed. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to get into yeah, the factors that um, we're going to throw into the mix, um, other than to note the statements that um, we've made previously around you know, preferred capital management settings, strong investment grade, and those types of things. So, I think that is that's still the yeah you know, the, the the weather vane from a capital management perspective. Um, and dividend conversations, you know, we, we will need to work through with the board. Um, December's December, um, interim results are February, so you can probably expect us to be saying something further in February, Blair. Thank you. Uh, on the CapEx and the UFB programme, um, if your question is, have you made any provision for UFB 2 in your CapEx guidance, the answer is no. Um, and that was my question, thanks, yeah. Um, and sorry, in, in terms of the service provider, um, 
the um, non-standard, um, your non-standard question or point is exactly right. Um, so I mean there are, I think th this is a situation where a broader industry approach you know, would be helpful. This is not just um, a chorus issue or a crown issue. Uh, it affects retail service providers and end users. So I think there is, there is an opportunity for the industry to um, work constructively to find a solution here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question we have is from Tristan Joel from UBS. Please go ahead, sir. Morning, guys. Um, I just wanted to carry on on that um, on standard theme a little bit. I mean, I, you know, if you if you were to characterise it, I just want to be very clear that um, this is about finding a solution for. Um, something which you're not contracted to do. So there's a recognition in this discussion that, um, you know, it, it, I suppose it's a collaborative fix. It's not just a case of chorus throwing more money in the pot. That's, yep. that's, yep. Okay. Um, and then secondly, just, um, you know, understanding that market, um, you know, market numbers out there probably do include um, some element of FPP change, or a lot of them do. Um, you know, it would be reasonable to say that the underlying sort of um, decline, I guess you pointed to, on the adjusted number would, would apply with the FPP also, or if the FPP were to come through as it stands? Yes, I mean, you'll need to make your own assumption about what number might apply from 1 December, but we're talking about um, underlying trends, if you like. So whatever price you think appropriate, Tristan, that's, that's the underlying... Um, EBITDA trend that we see for FY16. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a cost. It's a cost story at this point. Um, well, it's two, then, uh, just, there's just probably two factors. I mean, there is there is a change in the cost mix for the next year, but there's also uh, an increasing acceleration uh, of moving away from legacy high price services onto uh, more modern ones as well, which has an impact on EBITDA. Yeah, and, and that's going both yep. ways, you know, our revenue line and our cost line. So, yeah, that movement from away from legacy services, you know, we're seeing in terms of baseband IP, um, but it, equally it's it's happening in other areas which is impacting the revenue line, as Mark, um, as Mark mentioned. Yep, and then, uh, and then just, just generically, um, you know, you revised, or I suppose you narrowed, and you narrowed the communal capex Guidance for the project to the lower, lower end. Um, last result, you know, there's nothing that I see in this CPP guidance that tells me things are getting other, anything other than cheaper. Um, you know, is there any sort of directional indication as to where you are on that revised guidance? Are you sort of thinking now you'll be at the lower end of that guidance? No, I think the guidance remains uh, as it was, Tristan. You know, we noted that um, the guidance range really reflect, I mean it, it is if they are fixed price contracts but the the breadth of the range reflects the degree of contract variation and the ultimate mix of aerial that we're able to realise and you know we're at the, you know we're still relatively early days in terms of the second part of the program so there's there's not anything we can point to at this point that, that tells us we're at one part or another part of that range. That okay, cool. Range. And then just, just finally, oh, sorry, just, just finally, it's, um, you know, it's probably not really your question to answer, but I guess, do you, do you have any sense of when MB and the government are going to progress this issue around, you know, the Telco Act review? I, I thought we would do something a month or two back. It doesn't seem to have happened. Is there any procedural reason for that, or what, what are you expecting? I think we're expecting soon, Tristan. Okay. Whatever that means. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll wait and see. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. The next question we have is from Peter Wise from IDC. Please go ahead, Peter. Hi there. Um, just got a couple of questions. Just wondered, Blair might have covered it a bit, but um, wondered if we could have an update on USB 2 and where you sort of see that playing out. And then just a thought on the... Um, I noticed your BDSL speed effectively is going to go up. Is there any kind of thought to try to withdraw the, the entry-level fibre product, which is sort of now at 30, it seems to be sort of 
you know, too slow and it, it, it sort of accelerates people to 100 meg, but is there any way you can do that yourself? Uh, hi, Peter. Look, I might take those two, uh, if that's OK. Um, I mean, on UFB2, uh, we are, remain, um, I guess, emotionally uh, very supportive of the whole thing, would love to be involved, uh, but are keen, keen to understand what the regulatory settings uh, would be before we're able to make any more definitive. And I think, like the regulatory review, the next stage of the process is sort of soon to s experience... Uh, I think I think it goes to RFP next, and what the terms of that will be. But you'll certainly see us participating. Um, on the uh, 30 meg product, that's a contracted reference product uh, that would only be uh, um, uh, withdrawn with agreement with the Crown. I think. I mean, I think you can see with 75% of people in July taking the 100 meg product, then we're on a pretty it's pretty clear where people are going to, and we're also seeing a shift um, uh, upwards. Um, yeah, the, the price differential is relatively modest, even at the retail level. Yeah. Is there any thought to um, lowering the VD sale price as well? I think I gather some of the RSPs. I think it's around the install cost. It sort of makes it a little bit more expensive. Uh, I mean, we'll look at prices all the time, but I think, I mean, we're probably more focused on fibre. But yes, we will look at that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. This is a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question at 01, the next question we have is from Adrian Albon from Craig's Investment Partners. Please go ahead, Adrian. Uh, good morning, guys. Morning. Uh, most of my operating questions have been sort of answered, but um, Andy, do you mind just, can you just run us through just the lift and the interest expense? Again, like I know there were a couple of factors in that, but just trying to, uh, if you could just get through that again, just so we're uh, on the appropriate basis next year. Um, so most of it is, well, two thirds of it is, um, there's 19 million of in effectiveness. So that's just the foible of our EMTN hedging relationship. Um, and, uh, you can't predict when that ineffectiveness shows up, and that's non-cash. And then the balance of the increase reflects the increased interest costs or interest rates post uh, the Moody's downgrade and the impact of the reset in interest rate uh, hedging uh, that we undertook to realise $30 million worth of cash. Okay, thank you. And then just, just within the FY16 um, guidance, does that include the recent downgrade on your transaction charges as well that the ComCom's sort of guiding to? No, it doesn't. It's based on IPP pricing, Adrian. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you, Adrian. We currently have no further questions in queue. Just to remind participants, 01 if you have a question. At this stage, Mark and Andrew, oh, we have a follow-up question from Ari from First NZ. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, guys, just coming back to the USB um, extension, and, and Mark, I know you said that you'll be looking um, to participate, but, but equally um, that you'll be looking for regulatory um, settings to be, I think you used the words, uh, definitive. I mean, given the timeframes associated um, with getting to... Um, and then firstly on the review and then getting it passed through legislation, but, but then also, um, I guess, implemented. I mean, is that quite a strong signal from you that you, you may well just basically take the principal view that, that not, not participating when you don't know what the outcomes are going to be is where you're at? Or, or what would give you sufficient comfort over the next 12 months to be able to, you know, at least make a calculated assessment of, um, of participating in that extension? Uh, look, I don't want to get definitive because we haven't seen either of the documents. So all what we are definitive about is that we would really like to be involved um, and, yeah. and really hope that there, I think we've signaled that over and over again, that, that we'd love to be part of the next phase. We've enjoyed the, being part of this one. I think it's really important for the company. But it's difficult to make commitments to something when you don't understand the pricing 
regime that will be in place. It's just, I think it's a pretty simple thing, and, and I think any other organisation would be in exactly the same boat as us. And, and uh, uh, you know, you talk to other industry participants, they're also keen to be involved, but, you know, what's the price? And I think it's as simple as that. But, I mean, we'd like, we really want to be there. So, you know, I think the government knows that, and I'm sure that is they're thinking that through as they issue the two documents that are going to be available soon. Cool. Thank you for clarifying. Right. Thank you, Ari. Mark and Andrew, we have no further questions at this time. Okay, then. I shall declare the meeting closed, and thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you.